One of the initiatives of the new Hermetically Open project is a series of webinars uh, given by professors from the Centre for History of Hermetic Philosophy. I'll be giving three of them and the, the others will be given by Wouter and Marco. Um, my three choices are, uh, if anyone who knows me is watching this, they will laugh because I'm very predictable. One is... Um, a session, the first webinar on Heinrich Kunrat of Leipzig. This is a work I have really been in love with, I have to say, and obsessed by for years. It was the focus of my PhD project. Um, and it's this book. It's the Amphitheatre of Eternal Wisdom, uh, which is described as Christian Kabbalist, divinely magical and physico-chemical. So for me, it covers all joys or all sins. It covers Christian Kabbalah, it covers magic, particularly divine magic, and it co covers Christian Kabbalah. Uh, Kunrat is a fascinating representative of these different traditions uh, and um, famous in his time as, as both a theosopher and a hermetic philosopher. Uh, and what I particularly love about this book is the sequence of images. Uh, Umberto Eco has written about these and points out that they're never bound in the same sequence. It's sort of a mystery, really. The Ritman is lucky not just to have an early edition, but it has one of the rare 1608 editions, uh, which I will be talking about in more detail in one of the webinars. Uh, the Ritman doesn't just have the printed edition, but it also has this incredible French translation. Um, and you can see, actually, for anyone who knows their uh, early French, early modern French, the hand is beautiful, easy to read, uh, and really helps um, with understanding the Latin and German in this text. Uh, for those of you really keen on looking at Rittman resources, um, not just online but publications, this I have to recommend, Magic, Alchemy and Science. It includes these beautiful colour reproductions of the first edition of Kunrat, um, which give you sort of insights into sort of, yeah, how an early modern practitioner not just thought and wrote, but actually how he visualised his practice. This I thoroughly recommend. You'll see more of things like this on the website. Um, partly because one of the projects is a virtual hermetic library. We're going to have a gallery of images from not just books, but uh, the whole collection of sort of 27,000 books and manuscripts. Uh, not every image, but a lot of them, a lot of the most significant ones. And one of the hopes is that we'll get feedback and people will say, we're really interested in this image, show us that. So that the Ritman will then consider how to put that online. One of the images in Kunrat's amphitheatre is actually um, a pyramid containing the emerald tablet of Hermes Trismegistus. Anyone interested in the history of alchemy, or for that matter, the history of magic, with the famous as above, so below, will know the emerald tablet. Um, Kunrat is publishing his work at the very beginning of the 17th century. That century is famous for um, other figures involved with what's called alchemical emblem literature. And one of the most important, if not the most important representative, is the author of this, these images and this work. It's someone called Michael Meyer, um, who was at the court of um, Rudolf II in Prague, the emperor there, and he published a series of incredible emblem books. You see, uh, even the title page of this is a beautiful collection of um, Greek myths, which Maya interprets in a form of sort of mytho-alchemy. He looks for the alchemical secrets hidden inside them. But more than that, Maya is a multimedia experience. This is the first engraving, which is actually um, an image based on the emerald tablet. The wind bore it in its belly. Um, uh, it is what? It is perhaps dew, uh, the spirit mercury, or it's the philosopher's stone. People have different interpretations. What Maya does is he does an incredible engraving accompanied by a fugue, an alchemical fugue, and he does 50 of these. One of the reasons um, why I would really encourage anyone to come to the Ritman Library is not only do they have the original text, but sometimes you find these incredible rare survivals. This is from the 17th century. It's wood, and on it is painted the first and the 50th of the um, emblems from Atalanta Fugiens. And it really is very interesting to see a colour version of these. Um, yeah, I mean, the Ritman will be putting images like this and many others, manuscripts, incredible things that you won't find anywhere else because they're unique. They'll be online. Uh, but I hope, you know, not just for me to be talking about them, but for you to actually contribute, to communicate, to, to say what your enthusiasms, and I have to say, these are, I mean, I, 
I'm delighted to get my hands on this. Now, um, and I, people are always interested. I mean, when you're studying a subject and you're, you're trying to figure out what are these people in the 17th century writing about, what is important to them, it's always fascinating to hear other people's ideas. I hope you'll find our ideas interesting, but equally I hope you find stimulation from what you have to say. This should be a two-way process, not just us pontificating as professors, but actually getting inspiration and feedback from other people. That's going to be the focus this Michael Myers Atalanta Fugians of Webinar 2. As you've probably guessed, I'm English, so it only feels right that for my third webinar I focus on an Englishman. And not just any Englishman, probably the most famous early modern Englishman when it comes to the history of Hermetic philosophy. That, of course, is John Dee, the person who chose uh, the uh, coronation day for Queen Elizabeth I based on his knowledge of astrology. He's best known for a text which is extremely enigmatic. It's this text. Uh, this is the 1591 edition, uh, originally published in 1564, of the Monus Hieroglyphica, the hieroglyphic monad of John Dee. Um, and it's a combination of alchemy, of um, Kabbalah, of uh, general hermetic thought with Neoplatonic uh, philosophy included just for measure. Um, a mixture of um, a famous title page which includes uh, his symbol based on, well, the glyph for um, uh, Mercury, as well as the astrological sign for Aries, and, and various other images which are sort of concealed within the text. This, I have to say, is the focus of fascination for quite a large occult community in England uh, and um, around the world. So, um, I'm going to talk about that, give some ideas, not just of D, but also of his sources. For example, one well-known source is the On the Kabbalistic Art of Johann Reuchlin, uh, who contributes not just to D's ideas about Christian Kabbalah, but also Kunrad. Another source which anyone interested in um, the occult philosophy of the period will know is Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, his Three Books of Occult Philosophy. You can find this in English, of course, but the Ritman has got not just published versions, printed versions, but also amazing manuscript copies of um, different texts, not just copies of text, but actually original material that you won't find anywhere else. Those of you who do know John Dee will also know he's famous for a seal of God that he uses in his conversations with spirits, um, sort of invocation and of angels. And this manuscript, for example, at the Ritman, one which is being digitised, at least some of the images are so far, includes seals. This one is, is one sigillum. We've got various other sigilla on different pages, um, which includes sort of obscure and fascinating um, symbols, but also bits of text, names of angels in Hebrew and other languages and so forth. Some of that will, I hope, come into my webinar on D or future webinars. The whole concept of being hermetically open is that this isn't just an Amsterdam thing. Even though we want to sort of think of Amsterdam as the hermetic capital of the world, we do want people to come to the hermetic capital. Uh, so while the first nine webinars are going to be by professors at the uh, University of Amsterdam, we do want to encourage other people to come. We're going to have people coming, for example, we hope, from Paris. Of course, there's the, the famous chair at the Sorbonne, where Antoine Febvre developed a whole field for years. And now we have a friend of ours, Jean-Pierre Brac, there. We have England with Nicholas Goodrich Clark, who's the professor at the University of Exeter, and amazing students, uh, some of them I know who've already been here. Uh, and then sort of new developing um, centres, for example, in Gothenburg in Sweden, where the next Sway conference is um, going to be held. Hopefully people from there will be contributing. And of course, in places like the States, Rice University, for example, has a blooming esoteric community. And so the idea is hermetically open, they can contribute. And actually, we want them to contribute to give different perspectives. It, ideally, if they can come here, otherwise we'll arrange things where people can contribute online. And having just sort of mentioned universities, remember, it's not just university. We want other people to make contributions.